and go, what time um, at Harris Park? Okay. Um, so just make, you know, like I said, make those mental notes pertaining to that. And then on Sunday, uh, Sunday, uh, we will have photos for our fathers. Amen. Amen. We will have photos for our father. Amen. If we did it for the mothers. Why can't we do it for the fathers? Amen. So fathers don't come in here with no t-shirt on. I want you to dress up. Amen. Come dressed up for Sunday so you can take a picture with your family. Amen. 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 And so uh, complimentary photos by unique photography. So please, fathers, dress up so you can take that picture with, with your families. We have a time. 4 p.m. and sponsored by Sister Sister. Okay, awesome. So 4 p.m. in Harris Park, uh, Juneteenth festivities, uh, sponsored by Sister Sisters. <clears throat> Let me just say that um, I thank God uh, because God knows what he's doing. Amen. God knows exactly what he is doing. And I think that's why we refer to him as being omniscient, uh, meaning he's all-knowing. And the reason I'm saying that is because our speaker on tonight, we met years ago. Amen. I was showing him this plaque because uh, when I was uh, under the leadership of Pastor Donna Burgs at A. Leaf Baptist Church, uh, that's when I met Pastor Matthew Davis. And he uh, came and he taught us evangelism. And that was my first time as a preacher uh, being exposed to evangelism. And so uh, uh, long story short, uh, he taught us many sessions and, and uh, I completed it, y'all. Yes, I did. I completed it and I got my plaque. I got my plaque to prove that I completed it. Uh, Turning Hearts Evangelistic Ministries. Uh, recognizing Charles Stearns for his excellent teaching skills, turning hearts toward God. Watch this. October the 26th, 2002, founding president, Matthew A. Davis. Yes. <laughs> so I pulled it, I showed him in my office. I said, I still got it. Yes. Oh, yes, I cherish that. And um, it was at that time where I met Matthew, and uh, I tell you, uh, meeting him, I also had opportunity to meet Pastor Walter August. Amen. 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 And so we thank God for that. And it was during the time of our training that we had to go. I remember like it was yesterday, Matthew. We went to the West Oaks Mall. Because when you went through this training, you had to do on hands. Amen. On hands. But we went to Westwood, West Oaks Mall. We met in the food pantry, and from the food pantry, uh, we all got together on how we were going to approach people because it was us asking people about their salvation. And I remember it like it was yesterday, and that was awesome. It was an eye-opener to me on, on how, um, as believers in Jesus Christ, this is what we should be doing. Amen. Leading people to Jesus. So without further ado, I am excited tonight to present to some, introduce to others, uh, the wonderful pastor of the New Beginning Church located in Houston, Texas, Pastor Matthew Davis. Give an honor to God our Father, to Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. To the Holy Spirit, our leader, our teacher, our comfort, and our guide. It's just good to be here. Amen? I want to thank Pastor Stearns for having me. And I just want to let you know, New Hope, he was a good student. <laughs> he was a good student, and uh, it was several of them that were good students, and they, they, they held up what they were taught, and they, they worked on it, and they made sure that they got it. So I'm here today, and I thank you for receiving me. When you found out that your pastor was not presenting tonight, you could have gotten up and walked out of the door, but thank God you decided to stay. Let's go to God. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, Father God, to share with you 
We ask you to bless us tonight as we dig into your word, that your word will speak to us, that your word will make us better than we were at 6 o'clock. Lord, bless us, Father God, as we leave this place, we will have a heart desire to reach souls for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, during this series, I'll be teaching from this book. This book is called Sharing the Gospel, Good News on the Go. How many of you already have this book? Hold your hand real way up if you already have this book, Sharing the Gospel. Oh, they got, they've already gone through first grade. Hallelujah. If you need a book, Pastor Stern, have them book, those books, and he will allow you to have them for a generous donation. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to have some fun, and we're going to talk about Jesus. Amen? If we're going to reach souls for Christ, we need to reach souls for Jesus. Who is the Christ? Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Christ. He is the Christ. And it has been my calling to, to go from place to place and to share Jesus Christ and share Jesus Christ to the influence of influencing others to influence others in the way of Christ. Amen? So I'm here today because God has rescued me. You know, some of you say that little slogan and sing those songs that say, He picked me up and he turned me around. And let's listen at you. He placed my feet. I'm, I'm a testimony. He picked, even, every, every time my wife go to Indianola, Mississippi, it has caught the news several times here lately. Every time my wife visits Indianola, Mississippi, she reminds me that God reached down into the gutter and pulled you out of there. <laughs> he reached down into the gutter. So whatever your testimony is, mine is greater because God has blessed me. So I sit May 6, 1980, in Miss Bonner's sixth period class, Gentry High School, Indianola, Mississippi. A lady sitting before me, name was Dorothy Steele. We're sitting in geometry class. It is the time for us to go over our homework and prepare for the next day. It was May 6, 1980. I'm a junior, she's a senior. She's sitting right in front of me. Miss Bonner has given us this blank time to talk about some things. Dorothy Steele turned around and she looks at me and she says, you don't have to live the way you're living the rest of your life. She says, you can be changed right here, right now in this room. Dorothy Steele said to me, you don't have to worry about the earth quaking. You don't have to worry about the sky opening up. You don't have to worry about the birds flying around in the room, nor do you have to worry about the birds singing. But what you must do is repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. That little pretty girl, Dorothy Steele, had what I call the Dorothy effect. She was a pretty girl on campus, but she was saved. Everybody respected her. And when she looked at you, she knew she had you when she just smiled at you. And you knew she was going to talk to you about Jesus. <laughs> Dorothy said to me, what you must do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and for me. I bowed my head that day, May 6, about 2.30 in the afternoon, in Miss Bonner's sixth period class, room number two, across the hall from the cafeteria. I invited Jesus Christ into my life that day, and I've been on fire ever since. <laughs> Let's look at, at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is what Dorothy explained to me, and so for the last 40 years, I've been explaining to other people. Now, during that 40-year period, I went to parties. I drank some things that were a little stronger than alcohol. What? I even, mm, yeah, some stuff that, that I shouldn't have been uh, uh, no, uh, uh, um, uh, smoking. Don't look at me like that because your sins are different than mine. Because Romans 3 and 23 declares that all of us, it didn't say y'all, it said all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of God's glory. Therefore, we need Jesus. When you see people that will, will drive down the street and if you blow your horn at them, they will shoot you for blowing your horn. 
it is evident that Jesus needs to be on the scene. When you see women walking off leaving their good husband to follow some joker on the street, it reminds us that we need Jesus. When you see women walking off and leaving children that are their own biological children that they gave birth to, it is a reminder that we need Jesus. When you see divorce rates in the church, just as great as the divorce rates are outside the church, it is a reminder that we need Jesus. When folk come to church and you look down your nose at them as if you just stepped out of the clouds, it reminds us we need Jesus. Because our sins are different. See, we've come to the conclusion in the local church that homosexuals, lesbians, drug dealers, prostitutes, thieves are the worst folk in the world. I told the New Beginning Church, I want y'all to go out there and get all the prostitutes, all the drug dealers, all the homosexuals, all the lesbians, and bring them in because they aren't scared. They're, let me use proper, they're not scared. And I guarantee you, if we get them in the church, they'll go back out there and pull some folk in. I got a feeling that we've been saved so long until we got comfortable in this thing. Pastor Artist Love Lady of CBS taught me that the people who are in church by 9 o'clock are already gone to church. The people who are going to church by 9 o'clock, they're either headed out the door or they're already there. What he said to me, if we're going to do evangelism, we got to make sure that we leave the building. On a Sunday morning, we left Grace Church, the Word of Grace Church. We left the church at 9 o'clock, and we were able to confront a lot of people who were not in anybody's church. Oh, this love lady taught me that either they're already at church or they're on their way out the door to church or they're already going to church on the freeway. How many people do we pass every day that we won't even invite them or we won't even share Jesus with them? I was sitting in class minding my own business, flunking out in geometry. I was minding my own business. I was talking to God about it because I was asking, Lord, help me get out of this class. And I, I promise you, I will never get in another geometry class in my life. And Dorothy Steele turned around and she said, you can be changed. And she invited Jesus Christ and introduced him to me in a geometry class. And I may have had a Z average at that time. But since I met Jesus, <laughs> my focus became a little better. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you would stand and read, one of you stand and read for me real big, real loudly for me, please. Tell me what version you read before you start and then let's, let's hear it. Okay, Sister Hicks, come on. Okay, come on. Okay, hold right there. He says, who's talking? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the same thing that I preached unto you, which is the gospel. If you don't mind writing in your Bible, if you don't think you're going to go to hell if you write in your Bible, uh, underline gospel. Moreover, brethren, go ahead, sister. You receive this. And wherein ye stand. You standing firm on this. By which also ye are saved. And this gospel is what you're saved by. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. Keep in mind what I've already told you. Unless ye have believed in vain. For, uh, I, 
Unless you believe in vain. For I delivered unto you first. I delivered unto you first of all. Number one. That which I also received. I've also received it. This is the same gospel that got me saved. How that Christ died for our sins. Number one, Christ died for our sins. We're talking about the gospel, right? We're talking about the gospel. You thought the preacher just closed like that because it's, it's in, the, in, the, in good fashion, right? It says, I'm going to tell you the gospel. And it's not a new gospel. It's the same gospel that I preach to you. It's the same gospel that you received from me. And it's the same gospel by which you stand. And number one, this gospel is that Jesus... What happened according to the scripture? And that he was buried. Wait a minute, back up. You missed number one. He died. I'm an old man. You got to take it slow with me. I used to have an afro. I know you don't believe it. So, number one, he says, this is the gospel. The first thing he says that makes up the gospel is that Jesus died. What's number two? He was buried. Jesus was buried. And that he rose again on, the third day. on which day? The third. the third day. He rose again on the third day. Yes. According, to the scripture. According to the scripture. And that he, that he was seen. He was seen. Of Cephas. Of Cephas. Then of the twelve. Then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren. More than 500 people at one time. Some folk died. After that, he was seen of James. He was seen of James. Then of all the apostles. Then the whole group of apostles. And last of all, last of all he was seen of me also. He was seen of me. Who's as talking? Paul. Paul. As of one born out of due time. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So let's look at this thing. Amen. Sister Alfred, look at this. You have what is known as the gospel. The gospel is the good news. The gospel is the good news. Y'all take good notes because this stuff's going to be on the test. I'm not just standing here talking to be talking. Where is that? Give me that certificate, brother. Let me see that. Maybe I need to remind them. <laughs> the gospel is good news. And I just told you, all this stuff that we hear on the news is bad news. The news reporter has gone from 30 minutes of bad news to 35 minutes of bad news. I watched Channel 13, and the last thing that Tom Avery says before he signs off is, be kind to one another. That's the only good news he laid out all 35 minutes. He's gone 35 minutes talking about somebody robbed, somebody burglarizing, somebody being killed. and two, He has gone 35 minutes, and the last thing he says is be kind to one another. Let me serve you notice. Without Jesus, you can't even be kind to one another. So the gospel, the gospel is good news. Then she read, and she said, that Paul says the first thing about the gospel is that Jesus died. Anybody ever heard that story before? Amen. The second thing about the gospel is Jesus was buried. And she says, according to the scripture, he died. He was buried. And then he says, he rose from the dead according to the scripture. And then he said, he was seen. So let's look at this. You have the gospel, it's good news. And there are four pedestals that hold up the gospel. The first one is, Jesus died. The second one is, Jesus was buried. The third one is, Jesus rose from the dead. And the fourth one, which is the evidence, the fourth one is that he was seen. He was seen of Cephas, meaning he was seen of, of Peter. He was seen of the twelve. 
Then he was seen by over 500 brothers at one time. And I think it was verse number 9 that Paul says, Paul says, and he was seen of me, one out of due season. Let me bust somebody's sanctified bubble. Paul says, lastly, he was seen of me, one out of due season. Paul is the last apostle. Look at how you're looking at me. He says that he was seen lastly by me. I'm the last apostle. So now you ask me, well, what about apostles? You turn down the street. A group of preachers were standing talking one day, and a guy walks up, and he began to shake everybody's hands because he didn't know any of them. He said, well, I'm such and such, I'm such and such. And then one guy says, I'm apostle such and such. Preacher says, you sure do look good for your age. <laughs> he said, well, well, thank you. I'm, I'm 75 years old, man. Thank you for telling me. He said, you got to be 2,000 years old. So, so Paul says, I am an apostle that was called an apostle and made an apostle out of due season. When the apostleship handing out days were over. When no one else could see Jesus, I saw him. I think you got it. You got it? You see? You see? You got it? So in other words, we have to get to a point where we obey scripture, we learn scripture, and we do scripture. Notice when Paul talks about this gospel... He talks about four things, and these are four things that when I call you, Pastor's going to give me your phone number, and I'm going to call you at 3 o'clock in the morning. And as I call you at 3 o'clock in the morning, I want to ask you one question. I want you to give me this answer. I'm going to ask you, how are you saved? You're going to say, I am saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that gospel of Jesus Christ is the fact that Jesus died for my sins, he was buried in a barber tomb, he rose from the dead, and he was seen, and then you're going to roll back over and go to sleep. All the students of Turning Hearts have to make sure that they're equipped to, to recite the gospel. Will someone get Romans chapter 10, verse 9 for me, please? And then someone get John 3.16. John 3.16, Romans 10 and 9. We're talking about the gospel, right? We're talking about salvation. We're talking about changing people's lives. We're talking about making sure that children are saved. My wife uses uh, even evangelism through music. Our, our slogan, our theme is reaching youth for Christ through music. So what I want to teach you today, if you don't already know, or you can teach me, Everything you do, you ought to have an evangelistic component to it. If you can bake tea cakes, you ought to make sure you evangelize through your tea cakes. And just for knowledge, by the time this class is over, I just want to let you know I love German chocolate. It's got chocolate on the inside, chocolate on the outside, chocolate around the middle. If you bake German chocolate cakes, <laughs> make sure you got an evangelistic component in it. If you do hair, and you know, young men, let me just tell you, don't judge her by her hair. Because it could be my length one day and on the shoulder the next day. Are you with me? So you better look at the heart and not the hair. <laughs> Why do you, why you think the Bible says that God looks at the heart? <laughs> we got too many women walk around here talking about he's tall, dark, and handsome. You may need somebody short, red, and wrinkled. <laughs> Romans chapter 10, verse 9. <laughs> Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Yes, ma'am. Will you stand and read that for me right quick, real big for me? Romans 10 and 9.
if you would just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Thank you. You will be saved. You notice Paul did not say anything other than Jesus. He didn't say your deeds. I hate this, but he didn't say your attitude. Because you know what? Sometimes I look at folk that come to church, and I look at their attitude, and it, sounds, it smells like those hogs I, I, I raised in Mississippi. At the church. I'm so glad he didn't say by your attitude. You see, we don't have good attitudes in order to get saved. We have good attitudes because we are saved. Because if I ask anybody in this room tonight, if I ask just one person in this room tonight, have there ever come a time this week, and the week ain't even over yet, has there been one time in this week where you could have gone off but God constrained you? Look at y'all. Y'all trying to get corner on me in here. <laughs> Come on, Jesus. Hold him. John 3.16. Who has John 3.16? John 3.16. Yes, sir. Amen. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But watch this. This word so is not a measure or, or intensity of God's love. This word so, if you bag up a few verses, you'll see that he's talking about as Moses held up the serpent in the wilderness. So, if we believe in Jesus, we will be saved. You remember the story when the Israelites had left Egypt land and, and serpents were biting them and they were dying. And while they were dying, then the snakes that were, were biting them, God spoke to Moses and God said, hold up a snake, put it on a rod, hold up a snake. And anybody that's not too stubborn enough to look up at the snake, their lives will be spared. They will be saved. Back up a few verses. Back up a few verses. And when you look at those verses, you will see Moses held up the bronze snake. And when he held up the bronze snake, the people lives, those who looked at the snake, the people who looked at the snake, their lives were spared. So then when he gets to verse 16, John says, he says, so just like Moses held up the snake. So if we lift up Jesus. So if we look to Jesus, God loved the world so as he loved the world during Moses' day, so does he love us today. And since he held up the snake, the people were saved. Now, if he holds up Jesus and you look to Jesus, then you're saved. We sing that song, look and live, look and live, look and live. You got to look to Jesus. You have to look to Jesus. I'm sure some women in here tell you they couldn't depend on their friends, couldn't depend on him, her, nor them. But you can depend on Jesus. <laughs> and for your salvation, you need Jesus. We need to tell children, baby, I know you're living in a different day. I know I'm old fogey. Just admit, I am old fogey. I'm in a different generation. But Big Mama was here, she would tell you. The same Jesus that brought me here is the same Jesus going to take me there. Are you with me? So we need Jesus. Out of all that we do, out of all that we say, out of all places we go, we need Jesus. When we look at salvation, when you look at those three passages of Scripture, when you see them, you see Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for salvation, period. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for salvation. Didn't talk about how good you were. Didn't talk about what community you were born in. It didn't talk about you speaking in tongues. Uh-uh. 
It, it didn't talk about you shouting and running through the aisles. It didn't even talk about you raising your hand and doing your dance. These things we may do, that's left up to us in the Holy Spirit. But what we must do, Dorothy said, is repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for our sins and rose from the dead. Yes. And the good thing about God, he made it so simple, the wise man misses it. It's so simple. The late pastor E.L. Campbell says it like this. He says, A.E. Campbell says, he says it like this. He says, if God had told you to show up at the church on Sunday with the egg mixture with the snake venom in it, stir it up and show up at the front door of New Hope on Sunday, a lot of people would be snake bit. Because they would look and they will find snakes and they would show up at the front door because that is hard. People like doing hard stuff. But God makes it so simple. He makes it so simple that even our little children can get it. Our traditions in church have made it bad. Our traditions in church have made it hard. Our traditions in church say you can't wear makeup. And be saved. You can't wear britches to church and be saved. You, you can't wear certain size earrings. Our traditions have messed us up. God looks at the heart. I even tell the people at New Begin, I don't know about Pastor Stern, but I say, leave the girls alone when it's too high, too low, and too tight. <laughs> leave them alone. It becomes my responsibility to unpack the word of God where that which is too low will rise. Where that which is too tight will, will stretch out. Where that which is too high will go down. So it's my responsibility. You leave them alone. Let them keep coming. Leave, leave them alone. It's the word. You, you're not going to do anything but run them away anyway. I tell women, not at this church, but at other churches, there are women who, <laughs> the church around the corner down the street, there, there, there are women who go home and beat their husband up. You need to get to church. Leave them alone. Matter of fact, the Bible put the pressure on you. It says you be holy. The sanctified woman will win the ungodly man. The sanctified man will win the ungodly woman. Honey, will you join me down here? Bring our child up here so we can, we can look. She's up here. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. When you lose your own child, you go to prison. <laughs> can you bring the child up here, please? I'm on page number one in your book. I'm on page number one. Where's the lady that came in with us? What's your name, sister? Michelle. Okay, her name is Michelle. Everybody heard it? She judged me on the way in here. Even at the New Hope Church, y'all got judges over here. Matter of fact, Michelle, come hold my daughter for me. <laughs> I, was, I was coming up the steps. You know, y'all got steps that go for a mile before you get up top. I was coming up the step, and, and I had the dog, I had my baby, brother. I had my baby on the, on, the, on the briefcase, and I was bringing it up one step at a time, but boom, 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 boom. And my wife was saying, you about to kill that baby. Michelle was like, oh, that's a baby? <laughs> I said, that's how men treat children. <laughs> she, she said, oh, you about to kill that baby. Well, it's one thing you do have at, at, at New Hope, you have someone that's concerned about children. Praise the Lord. On page one, you will find Melissa. When I walked in Pastor Stern off, before he could even speak to me, he said, hey, Melissa. <laughs> we have, we've had Melissa since 1998. 
Melissa has gone to Mississippi. Melissa has gone throughout Texas. Melissa has gone to Brazil. Melissa has gone to Czech Republic. Even when we almost went to jail in Czech Republic, Melissa was with us. <laughs> On page one, you will find Melissa. Melissa is young. Melissa is beautiful. Melissa is vibrant. She looks good. She got pretty big, huge eyes. She has no stress marks. She doesn't look like she's been abandoned. Even today, she got a hair comb and a bull rack. Y'all call this a bull rack? She got a bull rack on her hair. Oh, that's a bull? A burette? Bull rack, okay. It looks like Melissa has no problems. But the fact of the matter is, she has a heart problem. This is our child. And when your child is in pain, when your child is sick, when your child has problems, you will do whatever it takes to get the child to the doctor. Some of you have had that experience where you got in your car, you put the double flashes on, you rode on the left side of the road, and you drove faster than the speed limit say to drive, and you've told people to get out of my way. My baby is sick. You ran past folk, and you hollered out the window at them. You wanted to make sure you did whatever you wanted to do and had to do to get your baby to the doctor. So such it is in our household. We got to get Melissa to the doctor. Why is Melissa sufficient to, to present to you? Why is it important for you to know? Because every person that you look at that is unsaved, you got to consider that person your very own child. And you have to come to the conclusion that regardless of what it takes, regardless of what I have to go through, I'm going to get my child to the doctor. Every unsaved person in, that comes across you, you must do whatever you have to do to get them to the doctor. And I just want to let you know the doctor is Jesus. He is Jesus the Christ. And if someone is unsaved, it's your responsibility to introduce them to the doctor. His name is Jesus. He's a great physician. He's the one who heals every heart problem. When you see people acting crazy, when you see children doing what, what we couldn't do when we grew up, we couldn't say, mm. we couldn't say that in public. We couldn't say that around a grown person. And we could not dispute a grown person's uh, word. I remember one time I, I, I told Mama, Mama, I didn't say what Miss Betty Lou told me, told you she said. I said, she said, oh, Miss Betty Lou lying, huh? End of conversation. You don't say yeah. You don't say no. You don't say mm. -hmm. You don't shake your head. You don't turn and walk away. You stand there like a soldier and you take it. Yes, ma'am. Whatever Miss Betty Lou said, that's what I did. Now I'm going to take the punishment, whatever the punishment is. When you see children that are doing what we weren't allowed to do, they have heart problems. They have a heart problem. And this heart problem that they have, you got to get them to the doctor. The doctor is Jesus. If you're going to be a soul winner, you're going to have to come to the conclusion that every person you meet is your child, and you're going to do whatever it takes to get your child to the doctor. And the doctor is Jesus. <laughs> People got heart problems. How you know people got heart problems? If people didn't have heart problems, we wouldn't need police officers. And check this out. If police didn't have heart problems, we wouldn't have the shootings we have by police officers. When people have heart problems, they don't know Jesus, and it's your responsibility to get them to the doctor. Thank you, honey. You got to get them to Dr. Jesus. It's so important to get them to the doctor. His name is Jesus. Now, she's going to abandon the child and make the child sit up there in front of all them folk. 
She doesn't know anybody in this room. <laughs> She's one of them old-fashioned mamas. You better not look away either. I'm on page number 20. There are five P's to effective evangelism. There are how many P's? Five P's to effective evangelism. The first one is prepare. The second one is pinpoint. The third one is personalize. The, the fourth one is picturize. And the fifth one is prescribe. That's a good, that's just you looking at me, that's a good test question. What are the five P's to effective evangelism? What are the five P's to effect? And then as we go through the, this session, we're going to find out that every P means something different, but every P points the unsaved to the great physician, the doctor himself. When I was at the Holman Street Church, a guy went witnessing with me, and as he went witnessing with me, he came back to give his report, and he said, man, you know, when I went witnessing with you, I heard something different from what I've been hearing from the other brothers. He said, well, the other brothers were talking about their lives and talk about what they've been through. He said, but when I went witnessing with you, you talked about Jesus and what Jesus has done, what Jesus will do, and what Jesus can do. But you have to be prepared. You're going to find out through your study and through your reading, and I don't have time to unpack it all tonight, but you're going to find out that prepare is the, grit, is the biggest thing that you need to focus on. You're going to find out that 90% that of your soul-winning experience is preparation. How much? 90% of your soul-winning experience is your preparation. Do you think Pastor Stern get up here every Sunday, every Tuesday, and just started doing it? I warn our Sunday school teachers on a regular basis, don't get up and give us a Saturday night special now. Some of the old brothers thought it was gone, the Saturday night special. But what I said to the Sunday school teachers, I don't need your Saturday night special. We need all week long. Amen. It's your preparation that makes great presentation. Amen. With no preparation, there will be a failure. There will be a heart attack. There will be a terminal illness. So your prepare, the way you prepare, your preparation is 90% while your actual presentation is 10%. It has been said that the average preacher spends 24 hours preparing for a 30 minutes to 45 minute sermon. 24 hours. So on Sunday, after I finish on Sunday, I'm starting working on my Wednesday night message. After I finish on Wednesday night, first thing Thursday morning, I'm working on my Sunday morning message. And then when other stuff gets thrown in it, it's no problem. Because it's preparation. You got to be prepared. You got to be prepared to win souls. There are how many P's to effective evangelism? Five P's. What are they? Boy, they smart over here in Wharton, Texas. My goodness, hallelujah. So it's five Ps to effective evangelism. I need you to study these because I'm not going to get through them all tonight. But what you need to understand is preparation is the greatest of the five. Your preparation is the greatest of the five. And all five point to Jesus. All five of them. You are not the doctor. You will never be the doctor. Jesus is the doctor. Jesus is the great physician. It is your responsibility as a soul winner to point people to Jesus. And I got to close. I want you to turn right now to John chapter 12, verse 32. John chapter 12, verse 32. And I'm going to give you a story and I quit. John chapter 12, verse 32, this is a theme scripture for our church. And so we believe that we ought to focus on Jesus and Jesus alone. There is no one greater than Jesus. Who's there? John chapter 12. Yes, sir. It's Mr. Sam Houston. John chapter 12, verse 32. 
New American Standard. If I, if I would be lifted up, will draw all men unto myself. What he's just said is, Jesus is speaking, and Jesus says, if we, as the church, the universal church, would just lift Jesus, Jesus would do the drawing. You don't have to worry about being the doctor. Take the pressure off yourself. You can't make anybody be saved. The Bible says that God does the drawing. The Holy Spirit does the drawing. You just put yourself in the way where God can use you. I used to go to, to um, Sharpstown Mall, and I would stand on the second floor. 23, 24 years old, I would stand on the second floor, and I would look down on the people passing by. At 23, I ain't had no money, so I just went looking for people. I didn't go. Some of y'all go, go window shopping. I went people shopping. I, I, I went looking for people. And I would say, Lord, bless someone to come to me that I can share Jesus with, that I can lead to Christ. And 10 times out of 10, 50 times out of 50, God sent somebody to me, and I was able to lead them to Christ. But I had to be prepared. Thank y'all for coming tonight. You, you all are ready to be prepared. You are preparing yourself to win souls. I mean, you're preparing yourself to grow the kingdom of God. I tell you a story and I'll leave you alone. Found on page 23. It was right after a hot revival. At the Holman Street Church, Pastor Manson B. Johnson was the pastor. Our guest was Pastor Alvin Boyd, James Alvin Boyd from Columbus, Mississippi. After the revival, we went to Kim Song Restaurant. And when we went to Kim Song Restaurant, I had to go to the restroom. Remember, I'm prepared. I went to the restroom. And women, let me just tell you, when you walk in the men's restroom, there are no couches in there. There are no chairs in there. Matter of fact, there's no talking going on in the men's restroom. But one thing for sure, when you walk in the men's restroom, you find a lot of brothers facing the wall. Y'all going to get with me here in a minute? When you walk in the men's restroom, you got to walk all the way down to the end to get to the stalls. But when you first walk in, you find a lot of brothers facing the wall. So I walked into the men's restroom, and there was a brother standing there facing the wall. I pulled right up to him, and I began to face the wall. But one thing that men can't do that women can do, once you get started, you can't quit. So I got my track in my pocket. And I pulled my track out while he's standing there facing the wall. I waited right good till I heard him get started. And when he got started, I got started. We're in the men's restroom, and we're just facing the wall. So he got started. I got started. I said, have you heard of the four spiritual laws? First of all, he's shocked because men don't talk in the restroom. Secondly, I don't even know who he is, so he know I don't need to be talking to him in the men's restroom. I began to go down through the four spiritual laws, and by the time I heard him ease up, I began to speed up because I get to get my whole presentation in. So I led him to Christ standing right there facing the wall in the men's restroom, a brother I'd never seen before and I've never seen, seen again simply because I was prepared. I want to tell you tonight, get excited about leading people to Christ. Get excited about preparation and God will allow you to be prepared to lead folk to Christ. Can we give Pastor Matthew Davis another hand? Amen. We thank him tonight. Yeah. No, that clock wrong. You, 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 you come back. <laughs> yeah, you looking at that clock. No, see, that's how they do me on Sundays, Pastor Matthew. Yeah, that's how they do me on Sundays. <laughs> Amen. But no, we are, are, are excited and thank God for uh, what we have heard tonight. And um, let me just do a real quick quiz. Let me do a real quick quiz. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? 
It's the good news. What are the four uh, pedestals of the gospel? Uh-oh, uh-oh. What are the five Ps to evangelism? All right, then. Give yourself a hand. Y'all pass. Y'all pass to one. But before we uh, give the benediction on tonight, Pastor Matthews and I, were we were talking in the study, and once I uh, showed him my certificate, and he said, you want to do it here? I said, oh, yeah, most of that. let's make that happen here. So when you complete this class, you will receive a certificate of completion. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so uh, make sure that you do sign in when you come, because you're going to go by that list. Amen. And so don't you have nobody signing your name and you don't come. <laughs> I know how we do. Amen. Amen. Uh, before we uh, end, any prayer requests or praise reports on tonight? Any prayer? Yes. Amen. 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 Thank you for sharing. And, and we give God all the praise, all the praise for the progression. Amen. 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 Thank you for sharing that with us. Any more praise reports or prayer requests? Prayer requests? Yes. Billy Hurd? Amen. Billy Hurd and Carter Scott? Yes. Amen. Continue to pray for Jessica Hurst. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. God is still a miracle working God. Yes. Amen. Michelle Davis surgery was successful. Amen. Thank you for sharing. Dora Simmons. And Henry Clark, okay, little, little Henry, amen, little Henry Clark, amen, I'm pray for Henry Clark, my classmate, amen, any other requests? Yes. Amen. Amen, 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 wonderful. Continue to lift up Sister Sammy Brown in our prayers as she continues to recover from her, from her surgery. Also pray for uh, Sean Lopez. Uh, he will be having surgery on Friday, so we want to lift him up in, in our prayers as well. Uh, continue to pray for um, uh, Darrell, I'm trying to think of Darrell, Darrell Woods. Continue to pray for the Woods family, uh, the ex-co-worker, former co-worker that I attended his service on Saturday. Continue to lift his family up up in our prayers. Any Any more prayer requests? Yes. Brother Benny Brown. Mm. Amen. That's uh, Sister Sammy Brown's husband. So we want to pray for Reverend Benny Brown in his, in his fall and that he recover. Yes. Yes. We want to continue to pray for Nikki Cherry. Amen. Lift up in our prayers. And the answer is no. You must be in person to be counted for. Amen. Amen. So uh, you can live stream. Yes, continue live streaming. Uh, as far as receiving cert certification, no. Any other requests? 
Any other requests? Amen. Amen. If not, let us stand to be dismissed. So good to see everyone out on tonight. Uh, we thank God for, for all of you who are here. Um, and, and when I made mention of the word no for the live stream, I don't know who's all live streaming. So if you uh, uh, present a, and, and, and I guess I'll have to get the dance to get as far as documentation, because I don't know who's all uh, live streaming. So that's why I said no. Uh, to be in person, I can see you. Amen. I don't know if you sitting there listening to the whole presentation, so I don't know. You you go into the kitchen and get snack. You do you to miss the five pedestals. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So you have to be here. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We give you praise on tonight. God, how we just so magnify you and we thank you, God, for your presence. Uh, thank you for being the only true and wise God. God, we thank you once again for you allowing us to assemble and to gather in your house. And we understand that this is your house, a house that you invite us to come into so we can learn more about you. God, tonight we've learned that uh, you have given us your son, our Savior. So that way we can go out and share with other people about him dying, about him being buried, and about him rising from the grave and being seen of many men. So, God, I pray that when we cross paths with, with anyone, Father God, that we be prepared to tell them the good news. And the good news is that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose for their soul to be saved. God, we pray now that that everyone who go through this course on tonight will catch on fire for Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, God, you have told us that we are the light of the world. That's the fire. We are the light of the world. And I pray that our light shine so men will see the God that has saved us. God, we thank you tonight. God, we continue to pray that you would broaden, Father God, the ministry of Turning Hearts Ministry. Father God, we thank you for you putting in the heart of Matthew Davis, God, to write this book so the book can be, be presented to the body of Christ. God, we give you praise tonight. Then God, pray for every family represented here tonight, every name that we're called out, Father. We lift them up to you right now. Why? Because you said that we ought to make our requests be made known unto you. And so, God, at this moment, we do exactly that. But we are trusting you for the end result. We are trusting you for the outcome. But in the meantime, we're going to lift our voices. We're going to praise you because the psalmist said, I will praise the Lord at all times. So, God, we thank you now. Now, God, we pray for uh, those, Father, who have had surgery, facing surgery. Father God, that you, God, will return their body to wholeness. The doctor does the surgery, but God, you give the healing. So we pray that you will heal their body, holistically heal their bodies. And then, God, for the bereaved, we pray that they will understand that you are who you say that you are. You are God of comfort. So comfort those families. Now, God, I pray that when we leave this place, never your presence, and that you give each of us traveling grace, and when we reach our destination, we will give you the praise, and we will give you the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And praise God.